This morning we've turned to John chapter 5. Now, you know, we had a little bit of break uh, in our study of John, uh, and now we're coming back to it. Uh, and it's an interesting thing because beginning with chapter 5 through chapter 8, this is a section uh, that's a little bit different than what we've seen in the first four chapters. And in this, these uh, chapters, we're going to see how the uh, religious leaders of Israel uh, began to attack Christ. Uh, they began to uh, try to uh, take his life. They didn't want his ministry. Uh, they didn't believe in who he was. They uh, were blinded. Uh, they refused to see uh, the things that uh, were uh, right before their eyes. Uh, and uh, so we see the Lord Jesus Christ coming here to Jerusalem. We don't know what the feast was because John doesn't tell us. John does tell us other times when Jesus comes to a feast. He names each one of them. Uh, this one probably was the Passover. Uh, there is one feast that they celebrated that was never celebrated just in Jerusalem. It was celebrated at home in their own city, so it couldn't have been that one. Uh, and uh, more than likely, as we look at this, we believe that that's what it was. But that's not the focus. The focus is on what takes place uh, at the Pool of Bethesda. Uh, now, let me just share with you, I'm not going to cover something uh, in verse, uh, end of verse 3 to, through verse 4. Uh, there is some differences in different translations over the years, manuscripts, and so uh, we don't know exactly what took place here. But we don't know that Jesus goes to this place where there are people who are uh, in desperate need and Jesus meets a need. Um, now, Jesus is going to do this healing on the Sabbath. And he is challenging the Jewish leaders. He begins this challenge. Up until now, uh, he has probably avoided so much of the, of the uh, animosity of the leaders, uh, but now he's confronting them. Uh, he's pushing it. And uh, they, of course, are more than pushing it back. Uh, they become very antagonistic against him. Uh, and we see this in the world. You know, when oftentimes when Jesus is presented to the world, uh, the world looks at him and says, oh, you know, what a wonderful man he was, how nice and kind, and, and he said such good things, and he did these nice things and everything. But when you begin to go beyond that, when you begin to talk about man's sin, when you begin to come to, and talk about the fact that Jesus came to be the Savior, then the world begins to push back. The world begins to attack. The world doesn't want to hear that message. Uh, and it is interesting that we, we see that in the world, but we see it in the ministry of Christ. And he told us these things were going to happen. And so what Jesus does as far as uh, on the Sabbath here becomes a real stumbling block to the Jewish leaders. Not so much to the people, but to the Jewish leaders. And so they had a very hard time accepting the fact uh, that he was the Messiah. They had a hard time accepting his spiritual uh, life and the aspects of his life and the things that he did and the things that he taught. And so this is a beginning. And we'll notice this as we go through chapter 5 and chapter 6 and chapter 7 and chapter 8. I'm going to go as far as I can this morning. Uh, I was thinking as we were reading through this, and you know me, that we may not meet rake it all the way to verse 18, but don't worry about that. You'll just come back next week for the rest, all right? All right, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord, that we always have this glorious privilege of gathering in thy precious name with thy people, opening the word of God, having the privilege of being able to read it and study it, and hear it, and to meditate upon it, and to learn it. This is, so we pray, Lord, that you will bless your word to all of our hearts. I always want you to start with me, Lord, and all of us 
as you speak to us. I pray you'll bless the word to our hearts this morning. I pray that you will help us as we sometimes sing, open our eyes that we may see. And may we see Christ and see him clearly because he is our Savior, he is our Lord, we love him, we cherish him, uh, he has done more for us than all the world could ever do for us, and we thank you and praise you for him. We ask thy blessing, we ask thy Holy Spirit's teaching this morning, in Christ's name, amen. Well, first of all, we have the healing of a paralyzed man by Jesus. Beginning of verse 1, it says, and after this, uh, well, let me, let me not read all that because Joe just read it. We'll read portions at a time. John begins with the circumstances of this healing. He said, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. By the way, you'll know that in some places in America, we have some hospitals that are called Bethesda. That's why. That's where it comes from. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now notice first uh, where this healing took place says uh, when it took place, I should say. It was during that feast. Uh, as I said, we don't know when that feast was. We don't know which feast it was. Uh, Jesus' main purpose here, though, and John makes this clear, was to come and heal this man. This was his focus. This is what he was doing. And uh, so he comes there. He comes there to make a, and perform a miracle because he has a message to the people of Israel. He has a message to those who are gathered there for that feast. Now next we notice the place of the healing. We saw that in verses 2 through 4, but let me just read verse 2 again. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. Now this pool... Actually, it's actually two pools, as far as we can tell now today, uh, was in the, uh, let's see, it was in the northeast corner of the old Jerusalem. When I say old Jerusalem, you need to understand that's the Jerusalem of the time of David. At the time of Christ, this has become much larger. Jerusalem grew, and of course today is huge compared to anything it was in those days, but that's where it was. And uh, it is a place that they call the Sheep Gate. And the reason we believe it was called that is because it was very close to the temple and that's where they would bring the sheep from the fields into the, the, the city of Jerusalem to be brought in as sacrifices. And if you remember when Jesus Christ was born, the angels came to shepherds in the field by night. Those fields were not too far from that part of Jerusalem. They would bring them, they would raise them there, they would bring them into that area. And so that's where Jesus comes. That's where this pool is. And this is a pool that is fed uh, by a water system that was bringing water into Jerusalem. They had a couple of these. And uh, water would uh, come in and and uh, they, they got a lot of their drinking water actually from that area. And we are told that there were certain times when you would see the pool and it would kind of had a, yellow, a red color to it and it was minerals in there that would kind of bubble up. So that may have been what, what was uh, happening there in that, in that place. We're told there that uh, there were a lot of people there. A lot of people. And uh, the Lord Jesus Christ knew every single person there. He knew all of their hopes. He knew all of their frustrations. He knew all of their disappointments. He knew all of their anticipation. He knew them. He knew them before he ever got there. And he saw their needs. 
And so then John tells us the condition of the man healed. Beginning in verse 5, we say, And a certain man was there who was an, had an infirmity 38 years. Now that doesn't mean he was at the pool 38 years, but he had this infirmity, this illness, this uh, whatever it was that prevented him, maybe a paralysis, for 38 years. And he goes on and he says, And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool where then, when the water is stirred up, but when I am coming, another steps down before me. So we're told of his condition here. Uh, John describes that the people in this area, there were blind people, there were lame people, there were paralyzed people. And this, you know, this reminds me of something. This reminds me of what sin has done to this world. It's sin, not individual sin, but it is sin that has brought illness and sickness and paralysis and death into this world. Now, the world keeps on trying to cure things, but we're not dealing with the real problem. And there is times when our own sin will cause illness. The Bible tells us, we're going to have the Lord's Supper in a little bit, and the Bible tells us that some people were ill, others died because they disrespected the Lord's Supper. We read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And so there are some sins that bring illness. But in this case, that is not necessarily the situation. The healing of these infirmities was one that was prophesied in the Old Testament that Jesus would do. Turn to, with me to Isaiah chapter 35. Isaiah 35. As a matter of fact, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he goes to uh, Nazareth and he goes into the, um, into the synagogue on a, sat on, a, on a Sabbath, they actually hand him the scroll of Isaiah. He opens it up and he opens it up to this portion of scripture and he reads this. And then he says, today this is fulfilled in your presence there. And so notice, if you will, in verse 3 through 6, Isaiah 35, 3 through 6. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with a recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened. This is what Jesus had read. And the ears of the deaf shall be stopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For waters shall burst forth in the wilderness, and the streams in the desert, uh, and the parched ground shall become a pool, the thirsty land springs of water, and he goes on there. The Lord Jesus Christ was prophesied that he was going to come, and one of the things he would do is heal people. Now, he doesn't say he's going to heal everybody, but it says that he would come and heal people. He would heal people of diseases, of paralysis, of all kinds of things that no one is ever able to heal. And, you know, if the spiritual leaders had only known their Bibles, if they had only known the Scriptures, and then they see what Jesus did, they would go, wait a minute, this is what the Bible prophesied. This is what the Bible said would happen. This is what he would do when he came. Now, either they knew it and rejected it, or they didn't know it at all. And as I shared with you in the past, they often didn't study the scriptures. 
they often studied books on the scriptures and other books on the scriptures. And, it, and, and there are good books on the scriptures, but we have to first start with the Word of God and concentrate on the Word of God. You know, we have another thing. Let me just touch on this this morning. We have something different in our generation. It's called the Internet. And we have today Facebook and Instagram and TikTok. And I don't know the rest of them. I don't even know them. And so many people are getting their information from those places, including Christians. And you have to be very discerning and careful because you have no idea what most of those people believe and what most of those people are teaching, and you can get false teaching from them. You have to be in the Word. You have to read and study the Word. You have to know the Word so that if you do go and search for information like that, you know the truth to begin with. Otherwise, you're going to be led astray. Don't become like these spiritual leaders in Jesus' day. They were relying on others instead of relying on the Word of God. Now, no matter how we look at this miracle, it's an illustration of the grace of God. It was grace that brought Jesus Christ to the pool of Bethesda. Now, how many people in that day would have wanted to go to that place to begin with? Who would want to walk amongst people who, who were lame, who were blind, people who were palsied, people maybe had sores that were, that were oozing out? How many people would want to be in a place like that? How many people want to do that? You know, I notice today, and I've noticed this for years, most people don't want to go into a nursing home to visit. Even loved ones. People don't like to go into a hospital. Even for loved ones. And don't look at me and say, oh, pastor, that's not possible. It is. I've seen it. I know it, and it still goes on today. And it's a very sad thing. And I'm talking about Christians. And when I was in Ohio, I, I sat on the chaplain's committee for our hospital. One of the things we did was we gave uh, credentials to pastors so that they could come into the hospital and we gave them a badge and they could come in the hospital at any time, 24 hours a day. And they could visit their people. We had pastors who sent other people to us to be credentials because they refused to go to the hospital. Can you imagine that? And we used to get in some discussions about it, and they'd say, well, they're busy. Well, I was busy too. They preach once a week for 20 minutes, and I preach four, five, and six times a week. And you all know it wasn't 20 minutes. <laughs> but I also saw relatives who wouldn't go and visit. I would go and see people and, 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 you know, I know some people in nursing homes don't know and somebody was there yesterday and they said, oh, your son came to see you. No, he hasn't been there for 20 years. I know that. But there's others. One, I actually saw it and knew that people didn't go. So you can imagine, here is a place that is filled every day. They had uh, covers over them. They had pillars that held them up so the people would be out of the elements somewhat. And, and all these people there. And other than maybe the families who would bring them there and lay them there and then and leave, who would go? But Jesus Christ went. Jesus was always that way. He is still that way. He goes where no one else wants to go. He goes where we need him. And he's there for you and I. 
There is nowhere we could be that he wouldn't be there. Nowhere. Now, Jesus didn't heal them all. There are times when he healed everybody who came to him. I was just reading my devotionals out. I think it was yesterday or today. Uh, they brought him at night and he would heal and heal and heal. It was amazing. There were other times he didn't do that. He had his sovereign will and design to do what he did. But in this case, he, the Bible says he singled out this one man. He knew that man. He knew how long he had been there. He knew what his problems were. And he came to that man to heal him. And notice the question that Jesus asked of this man. Go back to John and chapter 5. In verse 6, in chapter 5 of John, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Well, that's a simple question. What would you expect somebody to say when they're asked that question? Yes! I want to be healed! Wouldn't you? I would. That's not how he answers Jesus, though. Notice, verse 7, the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but when I am coming, another steps down before me. You know what he was doing? He was actually making excuses. Jesus says to him, do you want to be made well? And he begins to tell him, well, listen, here's the problem. I've been here a long time, and I can't get to the pool because other people are there before me. And so, you know, and he goes on like that. Now, I'm not picking on him. But I, his sad condition he had had so long that I believe that it paralyzed him more in his mind than even his body. And dearly beloved, we can get the same way. We can have something in our lives, some issue that we're facing, some sickness that we're going through, whatever it might be, and it's for so long and we pray and God doesn't answer it and we don't understand why. And after a while, we begin to doubt God or we don't have faith in Him anymore. And we become paralyzed spiritually. The Bible says his time is not our time. He does things in his own time. We want God to do it yesterday. But God says this isn't the right time yet. You say, why? I don't always know. I, I don't know. But I can speculate. I can know that maybe God has something to teach us. Maybe God has uh, designed it that there's other things that he wants to take place that, to, to, before he does whatever you want him to do. It can be anything. The Bible says that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to purpose. Think of that again. How many things in a Christian's life, Christian's life, not everybody else's, Christian's life, how many work for your good? Well, three or four of you got it. How many? All. How many? All things work together for your good. Oh, no, 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 pastor. Not, not sickness. No, 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 no. Not problems. No, 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 no. Lo losing my job. No, 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 no. Oh, and you can go on and on. And what you're doing is denying God. Because he said, not me, he said all things work together for good. All things. 
Hallelujah. All things. I think also Jesus has a reason for asking this question because when we go over the verse 40 for a moment and read that, we notice this. Jesus says, but you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. Now, this man does not know who Jesus is. He doesn't know him. Never seen him in his life. He may have never heard of him. He may not realize that the Messiah has come. He, he doesn't recognize him. Note that he says, sir. There he is. But praise the Lord, the man was healed. Look with me at verses 8 and 9. Jesus said to him, rise up. Your rise, I'm sorry, I read that a little wrong. Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked, and that day was the Sabbath. Notice the first thing Jesus commands this man. He tells him to rise, take up his bed, and walk. Now, wait a minute. I don't know his problem. I don't know if he's paralyzed. I don't know if he's blind. I don't know what his problem is. But Jesus tells him to rise up. And then the bed there is actually just a mat. See, he hadn't been to Mancini's world. He doesn't have a sort of peak, whatever that guy is. He doesn't have that. He has probably a straw mat. It would be rolled up, tuck up in the arm. And Jesus says to him, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And what does he do? He does that. Jesus healed the man through the power of his spoken word. He commanded to do the very thing he was unable to do. And that's the same in salvation. We cannot change ourselves. We cannot raise ourselves up. We cannot make ourselves a Christian. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot deal with our sins. We cannot. All we can do is rise up. The Bible says, Call in the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. Oh, that's too simple. That's what the Bible says. This man couldn't rise up on his own. How do I know that? Because it tells Jesus, he said, I've been here, and he says, I, every time I try to go up when the water is stirring up, somebody beats me to it. Apparently he had no family there to take him and put him in. Apparently wherever he was lying, there were people in front of him saying, me first. And I don't blame him. But in Jesus' command was the power of fulfillment. The cure was immediate, and certainly the people, I think, at the pool saw it and witnessed that miracle. And notice the man's obedience, verse 9. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked, and that was the Sabbath. Apparently, it never occurred to this man to disobey. <laughs> that was an impossible command. But I believe as soon as he heard the words of Christ, that God gave him the faith to believe, not believe on Christ because he doesn't know who he is yet. 
but to believe what he was told. And then God also enabled him to do the impossible. Faith surged through his soul. He responded, his parallel limbs. And so he takes up his bed and he walks. And then we're told, oh, it was the Sabbath. The Sabbath. the day that God has set aside for worship and rest. Next, John tells us of the religious leader's hostility toward first the man and then Jesus. We learn the religious leader's criticism of the man. Notice beginning with verse 10. The Jews therefore said to him, who was cured, it's the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? So here this man is. He's just been healed. 38 years he's been this way and he's just been healed. And he's got his bed, he rolled it up, he puts it under his arm and he takes off. I can see him now. Can't you? I wonder if he leaped once in a while. I wonder if he just, just, I don't know if he knew the word, but I can't imagine him saying, Hallelujah! And he's walking along, you know, and he's just going along and all of a sudden here comes the religious leaders. Hey, you! You can't do that. You're carrying your bed. It's a Sabbath. Oh, how terrible of you. By the way, some people preach to their people that way. Anyway. He'd just been healed. Wouldn't, you, wouldn't your first response would be, praise the Lord. <laughs> this is a healed man. <gasps> Look what's happened. No, the first idea is he's doing something that violates our rules. See, God gave the Sabbath to man, not man to the Sabbath. God gave it for our benefits. Now, we celebrate it on Sunday because of the resurrection of Christ, but God said don't work seven days in a row. Don't do it. He says, you need a time of rest. You need a time to come aside. If you don't come aside, you're going to come apart. I don't know if you know it. In, 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 for instance, a year ago, Russia did away with a seven-day. They went to an eight-day. Things fell apart. Uh, some countries have tried it. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So here he is. He's coming along, and they see him. And by the way, they had, they had added to the Sabbath rule that God said, don't do your normal labor, okay? So if you were a carpenter, don't do carpentry on the Sabbath, all right? If you were a merchant, don't go to store and start selling your soap, you know? So they didn't open the stores that day. Uh, when I was younger, years ago, certain parts of the country, we had what we call blue laws. You, you didn't open on Sunday. People were able to go to church. You know why they had blue laws? So they could go to church. You know why we don't have blue laws? So you don't have to go to church. Because, see, you're so busy, you need Sunday to be able to do all the other things. But God gave it for benefits. So he said, don't do your regular work. It's a time of worship and it's a time of rest. You rest your mind, you rest your body. 
you, you spend your, your, your time, your soul and spirit focusing on the Lord. But they had 39 extra things that they prohibited you from doing, and one of them was carrying a burden. Now again, this isn't a mattress that we think of. <laughs> this is a little thing that's rolled up. That was a burden. Didn't care that he was healed. All they cared about was that. And by the way, dearly beloved, we can sit there and we can look back and say, you know what that is. My mother had this finger. That was just before I got something else. You know, sometimes as God's people, we do the same thing with our own ideas. We have, I, I, I mentioned to you before, we have our lists. We have it for Sunday. We have it for other things. If it isn't clearly here, if that's what you want to do, that's fine, but don't, don't, don't tell anybody else. You and I are not the Holy Spirit in somebody else's life. These guys had taken the place of God, the place of the Word of God, and they had applied their own traditions. Every time I say that word tradition, I think of the fiddler on the roof. Have you ever seen that? He had that song, Tradition. So they had turned what God had ordained to be a blessing, and they made it a burden. You imagine, you had to think every day, every, sa every Saturday, the Sabbath, they had to think 39 things. Okay, I can't do this, can't do that. You know, that's, that was work. I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. They, you can only walk so far. But Jesus tells them later on, he says, you know, I noticed that you take your animals out to, get, to water them. That's work. And by the way, God didn't forbid that. See, they just made the rules that they wanted to make. By the way, let me back up for a moment. There are individuals today who claim to be healers. And when they lay their hand on you or slap you in the forehead or whatever they do, or as one of them does, takes off his coat and waves it at you, and blows on you, say, Pastor, why are you watching those things? <laughs> I gotta get my humor somewhere. If you don't get healed, do you know what they say? It's your faith. You don't have enough faith. This man had no faith. God gave him the faith. But it was Jesus who healed him. Another thing I notice. As soon as he heals him, he walks away. The man didn't know who he was. Do you know what faith healers do today? They gather a crowd, put it on TV. They announce it. They advertise it. Remember, I remember we, we used to say every once in a while, we'd say, healing service this weekend. How do you know that? <laughs> How did they know? How'd they know it was going to happen? So it's like revival. I don't, I have to announce the revival after the revival, not before the revival. Well, now I've gone off. And so instead of rejoicing over the wonderful deliverance of this man, the, the religious leaders condemn him for carrying his bed, for breaking their law. In verse 13, 
But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn multitudes being in that place. Now, Jesus wasn't going to leave this man without knowledge of himself. And so we learn that Jesus meets the man in the temple area. The man goes. And notice verses 14 and 15. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple, said to him, See, you've been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Now, I think the man went to the temple to thank the Lord. I think he went to the temple because he knew there were certain sacrifices you, you made when you, when you were healed or God blessed you in some way. And so I think he went there. He knew where to find God. But he didn't know where to find Jesus. But the Lord lay, later on found him. Because Jesus knows where we are. He knows where we are in our life. He knows where we are in our problems. He knows we are where we are in everything. He knows. He didn't know where to find Jesus, but Jesus knew where to find him. And so the man goes and he shares with those who had gotten on his case who it was. He said it was Jesus. I'm going to stop there. There's so much more to share with you this morning in this passage. And we're going to have the Lord's Supper, so we're going to stop right there. But let's just remember... The Lord knows your need. The Lord knows what you're going through. The Lord knows how long you have been suffering, you have been struggling, you have been going through something, or many things. He knows. And it's not knowledge like a computer has, like AI. AI is still whatever you put in is what comes out. Things haven't changed. He has an intimate, personal knowledge of you. When we're saved, we have an intimate, personal relationship with Christ. He knows. And he never leaves us. He never forsakes us. Don't get discouraged. Don't. Don't be like this man who really, and and let's face it, if I was him, I would have been the same way 39 years, 38 years. I would have been the same way. But don't get discouraged. It's been a long time for some of you for some things. But Jesus knows. Jesus cares. Jesus will come and do what you need. Jesus will answer your prayers. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Even though you're going through something, he is where? He's still with you. He's still with you. He loves you. And he will heal us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a blessing to see (laughs) your omnipotence, your omniscience, your omnipresence, to see that you're all-knowing. You're ever powerful. You're ever present. Oh, how we see that here. Here was a man in a crowd who knew he was there, but you knew he was there. Here was a man who was crippled and couldn't get down, move fast enough to get into the water, but you had the power 
to heal him and heal him completely and to give him the faith to believe when you said, rise, take up your bed and walk. And Jesus was there as he's always with us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the testimony of this incredible event at the pool of Bethesda, the place of healing. Because the greatest healer came and brought everlasting healing, everlasting peace. And we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.